Questions without notice. I give the call to the Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Earlier today, I joined the Prime Minister at the National Museum for the unveiling of a permanent display of letters exchanged between Mr Walter Mickack and then Prime Minister John Howard, which were instrumental in the decision by Mr Howard to deliver historic gun control reforms. On the 28th of April 1996, Mr Mickack's wife, Nanette, and daughters, Alana and Madeline Mickack, aged six and three, were amongst 35 Australians murdered at Port Arthur. The Alana and Madeline Foundation honours their memory and champions the right of children to live free from violence and trauma. Can the Prime Minister update the House on the importance of the Foundation and of the permanent display unveiled this morning? The call to the Prime Minister. I thank the Leader of the Opposition for his question and for joining me uh, today at what was a very moving ceremony. And it was my great honour uh, to uh, be the patron, along with uh, past Prime Ministers of the Alana and Madeline Foundation. I want to acknowledge in the chamber, uh, in the gallery today, uh, Walter Mickack, AM, uh, the founding patron, a person who took such personal tragedy and turned it into a story which has made Australia a better nation. Speak. I want to also acknowledge uh, Walter's partner, Bridget, who joined us this morning, uh, Sarah Davies, the CEO of the Foundation, and Greg Sutherland, the chair of the Foundation, who are with us today. And I know that uh, I spoke with John Howard this morning, and uh, he unfortunately wasn't well enough uh, to travel, uh, but the Leader of the Opposition uh, ably fulfilled uh, his position this morning. Um, the letters that we added to our National Museum today tell the story of such a devastating tragedy. The first letter that Walter Mickack wrote to the Prime Minister, John Howard, in ordinary blue biro, it's there for people to see on foolscap paper. <laughs> it's one of the most extraordinary things that anyone can read in their life. And now people who visit the National Museum will be able to do it. The opening sentence alone stands, I think, as a monument to the grace and bravery of this truly great Australian that we've honoured just before. It said this, Dear Mr Howard, as the person who lost his wife and two beautiful daughters at Port Arthur, I am writing to you to give you the strength to ensure no person in Australia ever has to suffer such a loss. Pretty remarkable that uh, Mr Mickack wrote to Prime Minister Howard about giving him strength at that time. A bare nine days after losing those three people who he loved more than anyone else in the world to this act of uh, unspeakable violence uh, at Port Arthur, uh, not only uh, did he find the strength to think of others, he tried to make sure in reaching out uh, that no one would suffer as Mr Mickack had. Uh, sharing that strength, encouraging the Prime Minister to act. And I want to pay tribute to John Howard for the courage and the determination that he showed in that moment of national challenge. Yeah. Importantly, uh, he had bipartisan support from Kim Beasley and from the Labor team, which meant that it was possible to go forward. Uh, I want to, uh, as I did this morning too, single out Tim Fisher. Um, Tim, someone I had the enormous respect for. I travelled uh, to his hometown uh, for his funeral. And uh, Tim, um, for the National Party leader at that time, where the angst and, quite frankly, fury and threats that went on, for him to stand up 
uh, as a National Party leader, I think um, puts his place in history uh, for other things as well, but for that, above anything else, I think his place in history is assured. And uh, I know that uh, that's felt across the chamber. The reforms that were passed have seen the death rate from firearms in this country halve since 1996, at a time when our population, of course, has just about doubled uh, in that time, and at a time where we wake up too many mornings to news of school shootings and mass murder in the United States of America. The world looks at Australia and looks at those reforms and says that's where we should be. But it takes politi political leadership to get there and John Howard showed it. The reforms, though, need to be continued. And just last Friday, the Attorney General and the Police Minister's Council unanimously agreed to present <coughs> options for a new National Firearms Register to be considered by National Cabinet. Yeah. This is action arising from the tragedy that we saw in the leader of the National Party's electorate uh, with the murder of two police officers and the neighbour who went to help. It is important we get this done. And premiers and chief ministers are all committed to getting it done. And again, you can only do these hard things with bipartisan support. So that's important as well. It's important to recognise that uh, arising out of uh, this incredible tragedy uh, that uh, Alana and Madeline, through the, the foundation, of course, um, didn't live long enough, tragically, to know that their dad is a hero, not just to, to them, but to all Australians. But he certainly is that. And uh, today, um, I, I'm, I'm sure I speak on behalf of uh, myself and the Leader of the Opposition to say that it was our great privilege uh, to be present at uh, a hero, while well, a hero spoke, and to give that example to other Australians um, You've made a difference, sir, to this country. And uh, we pay tribute to you today and we honour you today. Yeah. Give a call to the member for Flinders. Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. The government assured Australians that the budget would bring interest rates down. Instead, we now find it has forced interest rates up. Our new data from Finder shows that 40 per cent of Australians with a mortgage are struggling to meet their repayments, up 24 per cent alone from just 12 months ago. When will the Prime Minister take responsibility for making things worse for middle Australia? Give the call to the Prime Minister. I, I thank the, the member for Flinders for her question. And of course, uh, the world is dealing uh, with uh, with inflationary impacts, and uh, inflation Solomon therefore has an impact on interest rates. Uh, the Australian interest rate, of course, is lower than uh, the UK's of 4.5, than the US's of 5.25, Canada 4.75 and New Zealand 5.5, 5.5. They're the interest rates in other uh, Western industrialised countries. And it is noteworthy that other English-speaking advanced economies do have higher interest rates. But uh, as the governor said uh, at uh, the uh, Morgan Stanley Australia Summit on the 7th of June, he said this, uh, the situation is improving. He said inflation is coming down. There is also evidence of declining inflation <laughs> pressures in global markets. The member for KC. Uh, he then went on to say, of course, he spoke about employment, and we have some employment figures out today as well. Uh, he also said uh, very clearly at Senate estimates that I don't think 
that the budget is adding to inflation, it's actually reducing inflation in the next financial year. So one of the things that we're doing as a government is making sure that uh, fiscal policy uh, works with monetary policy, not against it. And that's why the, the $78, billion, $78 billion deficit that was forecast by Order. those opposite yep. has been turned into a forecast of a $4.2 billion surplus. And we know that inflation, of course, uh, those opposite would recognise, and I'm sure that uh, they know, that the highest inflation rate of any quarter uh, this century was indeed on their watch of 2.1 per cent in the March 2022 quarter. And we know also uh, that their budget, their last budget that they got Member the hand for down, where order. money was sprayed around in order to try and win an election, uh, certainly did not have an impact of working with, mo with monetary policy. Indeed, the exact opposite. Call to the member for Bean. Sp Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Home Affairs and Cyber Security. What recent actions has the Australian government taken to protect our national security? Yeah. To call to the Minister for Home Affairs and the Minister for Cyber Security. Thank you, Speaker. And could I thank the member for being for this question and also for his leadership as a local member here in our national capital? Speaker, we've come to office at a really, really important time for our country's national security. The Prime Minister has been clear with our citizens. Australia faces the most difficult geopolitical circumstances that we have confronted since the Second World War. About a year before our election, our national security agencies informed the Australian people that, for the first time, the biggest national security challenges that we face as a country are espionage and foreign interference. Speaker, grappling with these issues is difficult, it is complex and it is a core priority of our government. Speaker, today the parliament worked together to bring to a close a long-running national security concern facing our country. Russia has an embassy in Canberra, uh, located in Griffith. In 2008, they obtained a lease to build a second embassy here in the national capital. Our government has been advised that the construction of the embassy on that land would represent a threat to Australia's national security. And the concern, Speaker, is one of proximity. The land is a stone's throw from Parliament House. Our government received specific national security advice that allowing this proposal to proceed on that land would not be in the national interest and indeed that the scope for espionage and foreign interference from the site would have been a substantial risk for the nation. That's why today our parliament passed a law which brings to an end the lease agreement that existed between the National Capital Authority and the Russian Federation. The action is direct and decisive. We do not have any interest in sugarcoating this message. We will not stand for espionage and foreign interference in our country. We will act in the face of danger to our democracy and our citizens, and we will do so without any apology to anyone. Yeah. Speaker, I want to note something for Australians about the way in which this was dealt with by the parliament. The reason that we have been able to move so swiftly on this matter is because of the support for this decisive action from right across the parliament. Yeah. There is necessarily a lot of focus on the conflict that goes on in this building. There is not as much reporting and discussion about the moments of goodwill and national unity. I want to thank the opposition, I want to thank the Greens and the crossbench for the way in which they have worked with the government and the concern they have shown for the national security information that we have been providing them. Speaker, we face a lot of difficulties that will come to us in the decades ahead, and I think Australians know that. I hope that incidents like today give them some confidence that in moments like this, when it comes to the national security of our country, we in this parliament are all on the same side. We face challenges, but we bring to them the most important of assets, and that is the national unity that you saw in dealing with this issue today in the parliament. Thank you, Speaker. Yeah. Yeah. Indulgence, I call the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Well, I want to commend uh, the Minister and uh, the Prime Minister of the Government for uh, moving swiftly in relation to this matter. Uh, I think the point the Minister makes is incredibly important to underscore and for the Australian public to hear, and as I said yesterday in response to a different matter, 
for our friends and our adversaries to hear that there is an absolutely uni unified position from the Australian Parliament representing the Australian people that we won't tolerate foreign espionage conducted in a way that is against our national interest. We won't tolerate people seeking to interfere with electoral processes in our country. And the work uh, of the government uh, was briefed to myself and the Leader of the Nationals uh, and uh, Senator Birmingham last night. Uh, we received that advice and we pledged to the Prime Minister during the course of that meeting that it was our view shared uh, that it was in our national interest that this matter be dealt with expeditiously by the Parliament. We were able to do that and again I think it sends a very clear message to those that would seek to act against our national interest that they find no friend in this Parliament in relation to their activities and we will do whatever it takes to make sure that we ensure our sovereignty and that will always be the case. And call the Prime Minister. If, if I may very briefly, uh, Mr Speaker, just acknowledge as Prime Minister uh, the confidence that I have uh, that this Parliament will always act. Uh, we provided uh, confidential briefings uh, on the national security issues to the Coalition yesterday evening. They pledged immediately uh, their support. It's that confidence that's very important for our nation and for the crossbenchers as well in both chambers. Uh, all were briefed or offered briefings, and I thank them uh, for their support as well. Before I call the member for Hume, I just um, want, want to advise the House that President of the Gallery Day, a delegation from the Pacific Islands Forum, led by Secretary General Henry Puna. A welcome to you all. I give the call to the honourable member for Hume. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. The government assured Australians that the budget would bring down interest rates. Instead, we know that it has forced interest rates up. New data from, the, from ABC News found that amongst young growing families with a mortgage, 88 per cent are now in mortgage stress. When will the Prime Minister take responsibility for making things worse for middle Australia? Order. Give the call to the Prime Minister. Well, the Treasurer well, is interjecting. Mr Speaker, I, I, thank the, uh, I thank the Shadow Treasurer uh, for his question and I say that it just underlines uh, why uh, he will have Shadow next to his name for a long period of time. Uh, order, order. He Prime presided, over, the he presided order. over an economy that had the largest deficit since the Second World War and a trillion dollars of debt with very little to show for it, sluggish economic growth, productivity sliding backwards, declining business investment, interest rates going up, Member for Deacon. inflation the highest inflation uh, quarter Order. of any quarter this century, deliberate wage suppression, more Australians than ever in insecure work, and he comes in here and tries Order. to uh, just make things up. Well, compare that. Compare that with, with our budget and our position that we are responsible for. The first projected budget surplus in 15 years. The largest number of Order. new jobs for any new government Order. in its first 12 months. 465,000 jobs. Order. Pay packets growing at a faster rate Hume. in more than a decade. The gender pay gap falling to a historic low. If it's so easy, why didn't you do it? And compare, compare the, the G7 countries, Mr Speaker. Oh, so GDP easy. growth, we're on 2.3. Canada's next, 2.2, a little bit lower. France, 0.9. Germany, minus 0.5. Italy, 1.9. Japan, 1.3. UK, 0.4. US, 1.6. Participation rate, ours is higher than any of the G7 nations. Employment growth, we're on 2.4 per cent, higher than any G7 economy. And of course, we're the only ones with a projected budget surplus going forward. Going forward. So we're very proud of our record, in spite of, in spite of in inheriting inheriting a bin fire when it came to the Order. economy opposite. No wonder, no wonder the shadow treasurer 
can't ask a question of the Treasurer about the budget. Order. In the, the budget session. In the budget session. No Treasurer, he can bring a novel in and just read from it. Because from those opposite, he can't get a question about the budget. Order. No wonder. The member for Hume will cease at ejecting. The House, the, mem the Minister for Health and the Minister for Climate Change are not helping. The House will come to order so I can hear from the member for Aston. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. What does the latest labour force data say? How is the Albanese Labor government laying the foundations for more secure, well-paid jobs into the future, and why is it important to get this right? Give the call to the Treasurer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I also acknowledge the hero in our midst, Mr Mikak, and also salute you for your remarkable contribution to this country. Can I thank the member for Aston for her question as well? Mr Speaker, the member for Aston's only been here five minutes. And she's already asked twice as many questions about the budget as the Order. shadow treasurer since the budget reply. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, today we received very welcome news that 75,900 jobs were created in May, and the unemployment rate fell to 3.6%. This is a remarkable the achievement for the Australian Member economy and, and most importantly for the Australian people. More Australians are in work than ever before. The participation rate is higher than ever before, and a greater share of women are in work than ever before. The number of Australians with a job is now more than 14 million for the very Order. first time. The participation rate is a record high of 66.9 per cent. Women's participation is a record high of 62.7 per cent. Employment to, to population is a record high of 64.5 per cent. Mr. Speaker, these figures mean that more than 465,000 jobs Member were created in the first 12 months rejecting. of the Albanese Labor government, also a record. This is the most jobs created under a new government ever. It's six times the number of jobs created in the first year of the Abbott Order. or Howard governments, Mr. Speaker. Now, Mr. Speaker, we know our economy is slowing because of higher interest rates and weakness in the global economy, and this will impact the labour market as well in the coming months. We still expect unemployment to tick up over time. But, Mr. Speaker, New Zealand in data today went into recession. Europe last week went into recession, and there are pressures coming at us from right around the world. And what makes these jobs numbers so remarkable? is that with everything coming at us from around the world, we still have unemployment with a three in front of it. And Order. that means that we go into this period of significant global economic uncertainty from a position of relative strength. And we also go into this period of global economic uncertainty with the right plan and the right budget, Mr Speaker, providing assistance for people with cost of living pressures without adding to inflation laying the foundations for future growth in our economy and the sort of spending restraint which is necessary to ensure that we are forecasting a surplus this year for the first time Order. in 15 years, Mr Member Speaker. New England, Mr Speaker, Member these job numbers and the budget positions show that we are demonstrating in the first 12 months under this Prime Minister and his government the type of responsible economic management which would be unrecognisable to those opposite. And that's why he doesn't ask Order. me any questions. The Treasurer's time has concluded. Before I call the member for Wentworth, I'm pleased to inform the House that present in the gallery today is the 26th Australian Political Exchange Council delegation from the United States of America, led by the Honourable Zachary Ister. And I have a number of councils to recognise. This is all, only for once today, so if you haven't got them in, everyone else will just have to have the warm welcome. We have Karen Williams, the Mayor of Redland City Council and the electorate of Bowman. We've got mayors and councillors from the Ipswich Somerset region from the electorate of Blair. Morton Bay from the electorate of Petrie, Councillor Richard Lim from the Council from the Greater Daniel. Greater Dandenong Region and the Member for Holt, Mayors and Councillors from Randwick and Bayside Council and the Member for Kingswood Smith, and Mayor Jock Barker from the Town of Clare Claremont in the electorate of Moore. Welcome to all other local government officials. 
And I give the call to the member for Wentworth. My question is to the Prime Minister. Thirteen House and Senate crossbenchers have called for a citizens' assembly on the housing affordability crisis. If 100 randomly selected everyday people from around the country – renters, Order. owners, investors, people of all ages and backgrounds, rural, regional and urban – come together, consider the evidence and reach a consensus on housing reform, will the Prime Minister show them the respect of providing a formal response to their recommendations? And if not, why not? Order. I give the call to the Prime Minister. Uh, I thank the member for Wentworth for her question. I also acknowledge her serious commitment uh, to dealing with the challenges which are there in housing and her motivation uh, for the suggestion that she's put forward. Uh, I've always been of the view, though, that this is the Citizens' Assembly here of House of Representatives members. Uh, has been uh, my position. That's not to say that there's not a role for people to come together in different forums and for us to acknowledge that uh, more input, more democracy is a good thing. And I, of course, would acknowledge uh, any uh, suggestions uh, that uh, are put forward in the spirit in which the member for Wentworth uh, raises it. Uh, we know the big challenge in this country is housing supply. And that's why, as part of the reforms that we've put forward, uh, that we went to the election on and have a mandate for, is the Housing uh, Affordability and Supply Council to work with not just the Commonwealth Government but State Government. And I'll be speaking at the Australian Council of Local Government tonight and again tomorrow about the role that local government has to play in approving supply of medium density housing where, where it's appropriate, of making sure that land release along with state governments occurs where it's appropriate, in dealing with uh, the issue of supply. Uh, that's why we had in the budget uh, the initiative to encourage uh, investment in the private rental market through the Build to Rent program uh, that the Property Council estimates will create somewhere between 150,000 and 250,000 uh, new homes. That's why one of the first things we did in coming to government was to unlock uh, $575 million in funding from our National Housing Infrastructure Facility to be invested immediately in new social and affordable homes. And these funds are now flowing to projects around the country. That's why we put $2 billion additional in the community housing in the budget. Uh, that's why uh, we have the Housing Australia Future Fund before the Senate, which will create 30,000 new social and affordable homes uh, with uh, 4,000 properties for women and children as fleeing domestic violence. And in the first five years, of course, it will also fund $100 million for crisis and transitional housing options for women and children, as well as uh, housing to fund uh, funding for housing for veterans who are experiencing a risk of homelessness. Uh, we have all of that and we'll have more to say about housing in coming days. Yeah. Give the call to the member for Lyons. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. What do today's labour force figures tell us about economic participation, particularly for women, and how have the Albanese government's actions contributed to these positive indicators? Yeah. Call to the Prime Minister. I thank the member for Lyons for, for his question. Indeed, uh, today's employment data demonstrates that when you remove barriers to participation in the workforce, it does make a real difference. Uh, more than 465,000 jobs created in the first 12 months in which we've been in office, almost 76,000 jobs added in the last month. The participation rate is now at a record high of 66.9 per cent. But importantly, women's participation is at a record high as well of 62.7 per cent. And let's not forget that when we inherited uh, what we inherited uh, just over a year ago from those opposite, uh, when it came to women's position in our economy, uh, was that Australia had fallen to 70th in the world 
for women's economic participation and opportunity. We went from being the 24th most equal country in the world for women and men to 50th during those opposites' time in office. But my government has put enhancing economic opportunity for women at the heart of our agenda. We see this as part of developing the national interest. And under our government, the gender pay gap fell to its lowest level on record recently. There is, of course, more work to do, but we're making progress. Closing the gender pay gap will also help close the superannuation retirement gap as well. Uh, more women than ever before are now in full-time work. Women got two-thirds of all the full-time jobs created in the past 12 months, two-thirds. And almost 233,000 women have entered the workforce since last May. And all of this, of course, has been led by the exceptional women's Minister for Women, uh, Senator Gallagher. Yeah. And Senator Gallagher has presided over an expanding of paid parental leave, <coughs> making childcare Order. cheaper, implementing all 55 recommendations of the Respect at Work report, yeah. establishing 10 days paid domestic and family violence yeah. leave, investing $2.3 billion to end domestic violence, yeah. funding a 15 per cent pay rise for aged care workers, yeah. developing a national strategy for the care workforce, which we are doing, and, of course, importantly, uh, Senator Gallagher was one of the key reasons for us improving the single parent payment, helping 52,000 single mums out there to actually be able to participate much, much more equally in our society. All of these things make us a stronger nation. Give the call. Order the member for New England will cease it ejecting immediately. Give the call to the member for Parks. My question is to the Minister for Infrastructure and Transport. I refer to the Minister for Local Government and Regional Development's portfolio statement during the infrastructure portfolio consideration in detail this week regarding Labor's first 12 months, where she claimed, and I quote, we've done more in these 12 months than the former government did in 10 years. How many of Labor's 448 Order. community infrastructure election commitments have been assessed? Funded and commence construction within the past 12 months. Give the call. Order. The members on my left will cease interjecting. I give the call to the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government. Thank you very much, and can I thank the member uh, for his question in particular? We Order. have had a hell of a job to do in cleaning up the mess that was left by those opposite. Let me name Order. all of that. Can I thank very much the Minister for... Order. The Minister will pause. The members on my left... The Minister is 20 seconds into her answer. This wall of noise is unacceptable. A general warning now has been issued. So I want to hear the Minister. I cannot hear a word she is saying. I heard the question in silence. I want to hear the minister in silence. The minister has the call. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And I particularly want to thank the Minister for Local Government for the fantastic work uh, she is doing, and in particular for repping me while I was in Cabinet at consideration in detail. In particular, can I say, in cleaning up the decade of mess that has been left by those opposite, the first and one of the biggest projects we have had to clean up, of course, is inland rail. A project that started, I think, at $4 Order. billion, dollars, then got Order. to $9 the billion. Will dollars. Pause. Oh. Honestly, the Minister will pause. The Member for Parks on a point of order. Uh, on relevance, Speaker, there was no mention of inland rail. It was a very tight question. There was no preamble. There was no preamble. And if the minister spent more time on her job than trying resume to get me your seat. Resume your seat. <laughs> Order. The member for Riverina and Page and the leader of the Nationals, all three of you, just cool it. I want to hear from the leader of the House. 
to the point of order, the question included the statement that we have done more in 12 months than the previous government did in 10 years, and the minister is certainly being relevant to that. Order. Just going to ask the House to come to order. The noise level is far too great. The minister in continuation, and I want to hear what she's saying. Thank you very much again, Mr Speaker. And so, of course, the first of those projects we've had to clean up is inland rail, a project that started, I think, at about $4 billion, then $9 billion, has blown out, we think, we think, to $31 billion under the previous government's watch. We've had to do the work, a project of which there was no planning done, a project that had was truly inland rail, had no end and no start point, a project that the National Party had their hands all over and they should frankly be absolutely ashamed of. We've then had to clean up the grants program. The community Order. grants program in particular, the community development grants program, a three Order. billion dollar slush fund that we saw from those opposite that frankly we have had to deal with grants that went back to 2016 that had no proponent, no land. We've actually had to clean up those and take the time to do that, which is what the Grants Hub has been spending its time uh, doing over the course of the last few months, cleaning up that mess opposite. Of course, cleaning up the mess opposite they left the under for, the Building the Better Regions Page. Fund. Again, projects that go back to round two and round three that cannot simply be delivered. We're also having to clean up the infrastructure investment pipeline the with a review to actually Gippsland. try and look at. Did you want me to stop? Sorry. The leader of the Nationals and the member for Gippsland and the member for Page. You've had a pretty good go. If you continue to interrupt this minister one more time, I will take action. The minister thank, has the call. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker. The infrastructure investment pipeline that we've had to clean up riddled with projects that are underfunded, that were all about a press release for and actually not about delivering infrastructure, particularly into our regions. We've made sure that in the budget that we have delivered on our election commitments, and we are working through that process to make sure that they are actually delivered with integrity, with proper guidelines, and I make no apologies for that at all. I'm amused, frankly, Order. by those opposite who seem to have no concept of the notion of competitive grants or merit in grants, which is what we're getting on with delivery. We'll hear from the member for Morton. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations. How accurate have reports been about the potential consequences of the government's workplace relations reforms? How will the government's policy to close labour hire loopholes affect workers? I give the call to the Minister for Employment, Workplace Relations and the Minister for the Arts. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for Morton for the question. And he, he may be surprised to learn that the fear campaigns last time were completely wrong and the fear campaigns this time happened to be wrong again. Well, uh, what we saw today, what we saw today with the employment figures really says it all. I remember when Secure Jobs Better Pay was being debated last year and we were being told by those opposite that it would be, that it would be a bad outcome for jobs. Well today Order. And they also claimed they also claimed that, that it wouldn't deliver what we were saying it would deliver for gender equality. Well what we see now when you change the laws in ways such as Minister Richworth is doing with paid Order. parental leave, such as, what, such as what Senator Gallagher is doing with implementing the Respect at Work recommendations, what this House did Order. with the Secure Jobs Better Pay changes, improving flexibility and improving pay equity laws, we now start to see the changes in the workforce. We have not what they predicted, we have today record employment. We have today record employment for Order. women. We have Never today agree. record women's participation. And when you look at what has happened over, the last, over that last period, where has the employment growth come from? 49 per cent of total employment growth is women moving into full-time jobs. That's what happens when you change the law. But not to be deterred, they, we've now seen a new fear campaign, a new fear campaign about the, closing the labour hire loophole. First of all, we heard with one company 
claiming billions of dollars it would cost them, even though the policies they were assuming had not yet been determined. We then had an ad campaign based on a policy that was not the government's, not being contemplated by the government, not being contemplated by any government in the world, possibly a bit North Korean, but no one else. And yesterday we saw a headline claiming that the IR reforms will blast a hole with a multi-billion dollar figure attached, based on new modelling that had been done. So we asked the modelling company could we Order. see it. They said no. We asked the Minerals Council whether we could see it, and it arrived after I got it yesterday, but not in time for question time. And we went through what of our policies they'd modelled. Had they modelled labour hire loophole? Nope. Had they modelled our changes to the gig economy? Nope. Had they modelled criminalising wage theft, multi-employer bargaining? Nope. They actually hadn't modelled a single Labor policy. They had simply invented what would it look like if you took 1 per cent out of the economy, out of productivity, and yeah, it would look bad. <laughs> but for the people's pay packets who are suffering Order. from this loophole, the it means they'll be paid concluded. properly. Yeah. Give a call to the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. When the Prime Minister was asked on Tuesday if Senator Gallagher had misled the Senate, his Order. answer was no. What steps has the Prime Minister taken to confirm the accuracy of his answer? Order. The member for Hume. The Prime Minister has the call. I stand by my comments and I outlined uh, in a previous answer uh, this week why that is the case, using indeed even uh, Senator Reynolds' own words uh, when she returned to the Senate that <coughs> evening. Order when the House comes to order. Give the call to the member for Robertson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is to the Minister for Health. How is the Albanese Labor government making it easier to see a bulk billing doctor, and why is this important? Call to the Minister for Health and Aged Care. Oh, thank you, Speaker. And I thank the member for Robertson for his question. We are so lucky to have this talented Order. young emergency physician as part of our government. We all deeply rely on his advice, particularly in relation to health care, because he campaigned so hard, Mr Speaker, to deliver better health care to his community on the Central Coast. Better than most people in this place, he understood the impact of nine years and cuts of neglect and Medicare. He was seeing it every single day at his workplace in the hospital. Billions of dollars cut from Medicare under those opposite had seen gap fees rise and had seen bulk billing rates decline. Indeed, Mr Speaker, some of the biggest drops in bulk billing over recent years have been on the Central Coast and in the Hunter Valley in New South Wales. Now, that might not worry those opposite, because we remember the father of the modern Liberal Party, John Howard, of course, described bulk billing as an absolute rort. The Leader of the Opposition, in his first budget as Health Minister, tried to abolish bulk billing altogether. Order. The um, Minister will resume his seat. The Manager of Opposition on point of order. Mr Speaker, on relevance, it was a commendably tightly drafted question. How is the government making it easier to see bulk billing doctors and why is this important? It was not an invitation to range across uh, the record of other parties going back 20 plus years. And the Minister, who is a serial offender in this regard, should Order. be drawn back to the question. Your seat. The question contained a statement in there about why it was important, so I'm going to allow some latitude, but it is not a free for all for the Minister to talk about previous governments, but he can set some context and continue with his answer. So much, Mr. Speaker. It does, though, bother the member for Robertson, and it bothers everyone else on this side of the House no end, because for Labor, Bulk billing is the beating heart of Medicare, and that is why the centrepiece of our strengthening Medicare package in this year's budget was $3.5 billion invested to triple the bulk billing incentive. The College of General Practitioners described that initiative as a game changer, Mr. Speaker, and so it is. It's a game changer for millions of mums and dads who want the confidence that when their kid is sick, they can take them 
to a bulk billing doctor. It's a game changer for millions and millions of pensioners and concession card holders who have always relied on bulk billing GP services. And Mr. Speaker, it is a game changer for tens and tens of thousands of general practitioners, the backbone of our healthcare system, who now know they have a government in Canberra who deeply respects and deeply values the hard work that they do every day. Practices like the East Gosford Medical Centre in the members' electorate in the central coast of New South Wales, a practice that services more than 3,000 patients. Mr Speaker, before our budget, that practice was preparing to close, but now they say they can keep open. With the injection of confidence, the injection of investment, particularly into bulk billing, this practice will continue to service the needs of thousands of patients on the central coast. That is a package, a strengthening Medicare package from our budget that is already making a difference. Yeah. The call to the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. My question is to the Prime Minister. Section 4.1 of the Prime Minister's Code of Conduct requires that ministers, quote, take all reasonable steps to ensure that they do not mislead the public or the parliament. What steps has the Prime Minister taken to consider whether Senator Gallagher has breached the Prime Minister's Code of Conduct? Order. The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Uh, I, re I refer to my previous answers on this. Uh, Sen Senator well, the Leader Senator of the Opposition will cease interjecting. He gets angry, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister they returned to the question. He, he, Prime Minister returned to the question. To smile. He promised to smile if he became Leader, but we, we see, it, see it so infrequently, Mr Speaker. Order. Senator Gallagher has more integrity has more integrity than the people, some of the people who are pursuing uh, these issues. Uh, I stand by Senator Gallagher. Uh, she has my absolute confidence, absolute confidence, both as finance minister, both as minister for the status of women, uh, but also as a human being who cares deeply Order. about the women. Prime Minister will pause. In particular, the Prime Minister will pause. The Prime Minister will pause for a moment. Whoever was interjecting then can cease. I didn't hear it, but I will cease interjecting so I can hear from the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Order is on relevance, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister incorrectly suggested that this question is the same as the previous question. It is not. Respectfully, Prime Minister, the question is about what steps you took to secure your own reassurance about the ministers misleading or not. The Prime Minister in continuation will turn back to the question. Order. Thanks very much, uh, Mr Speaker. One of the things that characterises the very nature of who Senator Katie Gallagher is, is someone who deeply cares that uh, women, women who often as uh, the uh, member for Sydney said the other day, 13 per cent, 13 per cent of women who experience sexual assault take action and report it. That's right. Take action and report it. And I know that the... Well, forget it. Well, do you want Order. an answer or not? Order. Do you want an answer or not? Prime, the Prime Minister has concluded his answer. The Prime Minister has concluded his answer. Resume your seat. We're moving to the next question. Well, it can't be about the Prime Minister's answer because he's concluded his answer, but I'll hear from the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, the Prime Minister was clearly flaunting your ruling, and that point needs to be made with respect. Order. With respect, Deputy Leader of the Opposition, I'll determine who is flaunting my rulings. Give the call to the member for Hasluck. Yeah. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister. How is the Albanese Labor government changing previous approaches to deliver the AUKUS on AUKUS, and what is the pathway by which Australia will acquire nuclear-powered submarines? Give the call to the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister for Defence. Order. Well, can I thank the member for her question and acknowledge her service in Australia's Army Reserve? And if you'll indulge me, can I also acknowledge the presence of my good friend Henry Puna, the Secretary General of the Pacific Island Forum? 
It, next week it will be 100 days since our government announced the optimal pathway by which Australia will acquire a nuclear-powered submarine capability under the banner of AUKUS. This announcement represents one of the biggest defence decisions that has been made in our country's history. It brought to an end an 18-month process by which this pathway was established, but obviously, in a larger sense, we are just at the beginning of this journey. And so, since this decision, the government has been proceeding in earnest. The first tranche of legislation to help support the enterprise which will ultimately deliver the nuclear-powered submarine capability has now passed this House. The decisions have been taken to establish the Australian Submarine Agency, which will commence operations in just a few weeks' time on 1 July. And as we speak, there is a process underway for the appointment of its head. In the budget, we saw funding for an additional 4,000 university places in STEM subjects, including nuclear engineering, which will underpin what will be one of the biggest industrial undertakings that our country has ever seen. Mr Speaker, the global rules-based order today is under as much pressure as it has been since any time since the end of the Second World War. We are witnessing great power competition. The assumption that nations which trade with each other will never go to war with each other has been completely dispelled by the appalling invasion uh, by Russia of Ukraine. The truth is that we live in a difficult world at a difficult time. Now, the front line of our engagement with that world will always be diplomacy, through which we will seek to create pathways for peace. But it is so essential that we underpin this by getting the hard power equation right. And our future nuclear-powered submarines will give Australia the power to project, which will help enable us to play our part in providing for the collective security of the region in which we live, the Indo-Pacific, and the maintenance of the rules-based order within that region. These are huge undertakings. They are very serious decisions, and we do not take them lightly. But ultimately, our government's first responsibility is to our national interest and ensuring that each and every day we keep Australians safe. And on indulgence, the member for Canning. Thank you, Speaker. On indulgence, I'd like to affirm the opposition's commitment to delivering AUKUS along with the government. Uh, we have a number of gates that we need to hit over the coming decade before we become sovereign ready and receive our first Virginia class submarine. The first, of course, being the establishment of Submarine Rotational Force West in 2027. It's a huge task. AUKUS is a political project, it's a technology project and it's an industrial project. And everyone in this House has a role to play in making sure that we deliver on it and we keep our country safe. Well, Thank yeah, you. Yeah. The member for Bruce is warned. The I call the Leader of the Australian Greens. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. During the pandemic, National Cabinet discussed rents, and rents were frozen in parts of the country. Research today shows almost two-thirds of renters, about two million households, are in financial stress, and that financial pressures are greater today than during COVID or the GFC. You've said that National Cabinet will be discussing renters' rights, so will Labor at the same time organise a national rent freeze and caps on increases? Or does Labor think there should be no limit on how high rents can go? The call to the Prime Minister. Uh, what I think is that I thank the Leader of the Greens for, for his question. Uh, what I think is that we shouldn't pretend that things can happen uh, in order for convenience of negotiations to say, yeah, we'll go away and we'll just agree that I speak on behalf of eight state and territory governments who all have advice, who all have advice, because we have discussed this, that a freeze on rents would make housing supply worse and that housing supply is the major issue that we have to deal with, that we have to deal with. So what I'm concerned Order. about doing is making sure uh, that we do what we can in a practical way to make a difference uh, to Renner's rights. I've put that on the agenda at the National Cabinet. 
and that will remain on the agenda because I understand uh, that people in my electorate and in other electorates are struggling. I understand uh, those issues uh, very well. And that's why it's on the agenda for the National Cabinet. But uh, the member, of course, his party that he leads nationally is a party of government here in the ACT, in coalition that has ministers. Haven't seen any of those ministers out there who actually hold government, hold government, hold a position to support a rent freeze. None. 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 Your question went to a rent freeze. A rent Order. freeze is what you've argued for, and you've argued that yeah. that somehow the Commonwealth can speak on behalf of eight sovereign governments uh, when that simply is just not the case. Now, at the same time as the member for Melbourne is putting forward things that can't be delivered, something that can be delivered is the Housing Australia Future Fund. Yeah. It's stuck over there. Because your, your party is voting with this party, the Liberals and the Nationals, to block, to block 30,000 additional social and affordable housing units. Member Moncrief. It can be voted on this afternoon. All it requires is for you to have the same goodwill that, frankly, Senator Pocock and Jackie L Senator Lambie and Senator Tyrrell have done in examining what is required in recognising that this is an important way through. There are other things we can do in housing without this parliament, without this parliament, and we are working on doing those things. And uh, the, the member from Melbourne wants to exclude himself and empower uh, the coalition to block social housing, uh, the party that's never really supported uh, public housing in this country, then that's fine. But when you associate Order. with Prime them, when you associate with them, with the call to the member for Boothby. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Defence Industry. How is the Albanese Labor government investing in Australia's defence industry? Why is it important to implement better policies for the future of this critical industry sector? I give the call to the Minister for Defence Industry and the Minister for International Development and the Pacific. I thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member from the great defence state of South Australia. The truth is the Albanese government is reshaping the Australian Defence Force to meet the challenges Australia faces, and the government is supporting the Australian defence industry as a member critical partner in delivering the capabilities Barker. that the ADF needs. The government will invest record amounts into the Australian defence industry. We're lifting defence spending by 0.2 per cent of GDP above the current trajectory by the end of the decade, and we are investing in the nation-building projects uh, to construct nuclear-powered, conventionally armed submarines in Australia. This will not only give the ADF the capability it needs, it will support Australian industry, jobs and the economy. It will create 20,000 high-skilled, secure jobs. And it stands in stark contrast to the Liberal Party who wanted them built in Japan, then were on and off again with the attack class. And as recently as March this year, the opposition leader, better, better pol The minister will pause a moment. I'll hear from the manager of opposition business. Well, Mr Speaker, I'm not sure if this minister wasn't listening. Uh, when the earlier point of order was taken, which you upheld. But once again, we've got a commendably uh, drafted question, uh, but this minister is now ranging freely across matters which are not within the scope of the question, and it should be brought back to the question. Order. The member for Patterson has warned the... Here on the Leader of the House. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. I ju just to the point of order, I draw your attention to the second half of the question, which asked why is it important to implement better policies for the future, which goes directly to better than what. You can't describe something as being better without providing the comparison. Order. I'm going to listen carefully to the minister to make sure he is being relevant to that part of the question. He has the call in continuation. Thank you, Speaker. And as recently as March this year, the opposition leader was arguing that all the new submarines should be built in the United States, surrendering 20,000 Aussie jobs. And, Speaker, we're not just increasing defence funding and capability investment. 
We're Order. spending that money wisely, guided by the priorities of the Defence Strategic Review, including Order. on guided weapons. For the last two years, those on the opposite side talked about guided weapons, but what did they produce when they were in power? One thing, a single media release. By yeah. contrast, we've moved $1.5 billion into the forward estimates and we'll be making missiles in this country in 2025. Yeah. Australia will have a missile manufacturing industry in two years' time, increasing our self-reliance and sovereignty. Yeah. Speaker, industry also needs clarity. Oh, nah. We've Members done that left. through the Defence Strategic Review and we'll build on this work in the upcoming Defence Industry Development Strategy. Speaker, I'm also asked why is it important to uh, have better defence industry policies, and the truth is that's because we've uh, inherited 10 years of neglect and mismanagement. When the opposition leader was defence minister, he left 28 major defence projects running a combined 97 years late and $6.5 billion over project. He had a naval shipbuilding college that spent $114 million and trained a zero Australians. Zero Australians. By contrast, the Albanese government is taking defence and defence industry seriously. We won't have a revolving door of ministers. Order. We've shown that, unlike those opposite, we care more about capabilities for the ADF than photo ops and empty promises. Order. When the House comes to order, I'll hear from the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. My question is to the Prime Minister. Section 5.1 of the Prime Minister's Code of Conduct requires ministers to provide an honest and comprehensive account of their exercise of public office in response to any reasonable and bona fide inquiry by a member of parliament. The opposition has asked more than 30 questions about <laughs> Senator Gallagher and allegations of sexual assault. When will Senator Gallagher provide an honest and comprehensive account of her conduct, given her many contradictory statements to date? Order, members on, members on my right. The Prime Minister has the call. Thanks, Mr Speaker. I'm asked about questions to answer about uh, these issues. The fact is that since uh, the 22nd of March 2021, there are 57 questions were on notice in the Senate, uh, dating back to then, 57 questions which were not answered whatsoever, including, is it still the Prime Minister's contention that the first time his office knew about the rape alleged to have occurred in Parliament House on 23rd of March 2019? is 12th of February 2021. Is it still the Prime Minister's contention that the first time he knew about the rape alleged to have occurred at Parliament House on 23rd of March 2019 is 15th of February 2021? <laughs> Questions about the Gaitchens review, of course, that we Order. have not seen. Questions indeed. Did the Prime Minister's office tell Mr Dutton's office about media inquiries about the alleged rape before Mr Dutton's Chief of Staff contacted the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff on 12 February 2021? What information did the Prime Minister's Order. Chief of Staff receive from Mr Dutton's Chief of Staff? The Prime Minister will pause the Deputy Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. Mr Speaker, it's on relevance. The Prime Minister breaches for a piece of paper and rattles off a karaoke list of Order. incidental facts. This is not relevant to the ministerial resume. code of conduct. That is your code resume of conduct. Resume your seat. The Order, the member for Lyons. I want the House to come to order so I can hear from the Prime Minister. Because I can't Speaker. hear what he's saying at the moment because there is far too much noise. I'm just going to listen carefully to make sure he's being relevant to the question. He has the call. Thanks, Mr Speaker. And I was asked about questions and whether there have been answers given uh, to them. Uh, it went Order. on to also ask, did the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff pass Order. this information or anyone else? On how many occasions in 2021 has the Chief of Staff to the Home Affairs Minister passed on information about sensitive Australian Federal Police investigations to the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff. Mr. Mr Speaker. The Deputy Leader has always taken a point of order on relevance, so I'm just going to ask her to resume her seat unless it's on a different point of order. All right. 
Ali. Is it your view that the Prime Minister is relevant to the question I haven't made, with this answer? I haven't made a ruling. It's not the time to ask me those questions. Question time is for ministers. The question was about the statements and the issues surrounding Senator Gallagher and questions that have been asked. The Prime Minister is being relevant. I'm just listening to what order. Well, if you're asking questions about what has occurred and statements that have been made and about the questions, I don't know exactly what questions Senator Gallagher has been asked in the other place. So that I'm listening to what I'm listening to the Prime Minister carefully to make sure he is being relevant. But the Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. Mr Speaker, on, on your uh, point, it can't seriously be the contention that if the, minister, if the Prime Minister or a minister is asked a question about questions that have been put to the government, that the, the Prime Minister can somehow make relevant questions that were asked by the then opposition to the then government back in 2021. I mean, you, that, that can't be a serious interpretation of the standing orders in this parliament. I, I would respectfully put to you, Mr Speaker, it cannot be ruled in order, surely, for the Prime Minister to somehow, in this tricky and slippery way that he's been conducting himself... Order. Members on my right, members on my right will resume Members of my right will resume their seat. The Minister for Health. Just a, a few points in response to that, Mr Speaker. Firstly, there is only one point of order on relevance allowed. And it's quite clear the Leader of the Opposition was trying to have a second order of point, uh, point of order on relevance. The second point... Yeah, you're order. going well, mate. The, the second Members point I was making, left. it was a very wide-ranging question. And the third point is he should withdraw what he'd said at the end of that point of order. Yeah. The member finds the term unparliamentary. I'll ask the Leader of the Opposition to with the member if order to assist the House if the member feels he's been reflected upon. I'm just going to ask the Leader of the Opposition to withdraw the comment. No, noting the precedent, I withdraw, Mr Speaker. I thank no. the Leader of the Opposition. Just in terms of this question, the Prime Minister needs to remain relevant regarding the questions that were asked in the Senate. And I'm going to give him the call, but I'm asking him to be relevant to the question. Newsflash, I'm not in the Senate. And newsflash, I'm not aware of all the questions that have been asked in the Senate, Order. including today, because I've been Order. here. But I do know that yesterday they got onto the big picture because they asked whether an invite had been given to a wedding sometime uh, when uh, Senator Gallagher was uh, the Chief Minister of the ACT. A wedding to. that she didn't go to. <laughs> a wedding that she didn't go to. A wedding that, like many of us, I get invited to uh, weddings of people I don't know in my electorate. Uh, I, 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 I'm sure Order. that those opposite. I'm sure that some of those opposite do the too. The member for Riverina. If only for entertainment value. Order. But the fact is Order. that 57 questions remain. He the, specifically to one of the, questions. the Prime Minister is talking about the questions that were asked, which was in your question. So, well, I don't know every question. Order. I don't know every question that was asked in the Senate. So I've got to listen to what the Prime Minister is saying to make sure his answer is relevant. But I'll hear from the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Is is the Prime Minister flouting your ruling, Mr. Speaker? Well, resume your seat. No, because I was list, trying to listen to the Prime Minister as he was referring to questions that were asked, which was part of your um, question, and the Prime Minister has 14 seconds left. Believe it or not, that is a real question that was asked. Believe it or not, that is a real question that was asked by, by those opposite. By those opposite. Uh, the Morrison government failed to answer 57 questions. We still haven't seen the Gates Order. inquiry, but it is up to this parliament. Time does have has the power concluded. on a right. The order, members on my right. The Prime Minister has concluded his answer, but I'll hear from the member for Petrie. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. It's just on reflection on members. The member for Isaacs. 
made an unparliamentary comment to the Deputy Leader Susan Lee at the beginning of the question, and I'd ask he to withdraw. Yeah. Well, order the order the member. Well, I haven't said anything yet, so if you let me fin if you let me finish and stop interrupting, I'll ask the Attorney General to come to the dispatch box to withdraw an unparliamentary term that was made. I withdraw. Oh. Just move to the next question. Give the call to the member for Karangamite. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Regional Development, Local Government and Territories. After 10 years of not having a voice to government, how is the Albanese Labor government ensuring that local government can have their voices heard? <laughs> I'm going to hear from the order. We're going to hear from the manager of opposition business. Well, Mr. Speaker, that question began with after 10 years of. Uh, practice is very clear. Speakers have ruled out of order uh, questions or parts of questions about the policies of previous governments, and I'd submit that you should rule that part of the question out of order. Well, the question was about a time period. She didn't actually mention the previous government. If the question order, I want to deal with this matter. If the question had said about the previous government, but I'm going to listen carefully to the minister to make sure her answer isn't all about uh, the previous government, because that would not be in order. I'm going to listen to her policy announcement or policy topic. I give the minister the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Karangamite for her question and the way she works with her local councils across. Uh, her electorate and um, a big hello and thank you to coming for the mayors, councillors and CEOs in the room, many of whom know their code of meeting practice better than those opposite. Um, I'm very proud that the Albanese Labor government is bringing back uh, the Australian Council of Local Governments after 10 years, an election commitment that we are delivering on. A big week for local government across the council, uh, across the country. On this side of the House, we trust local government as they are our local infrastructure and service delivery partners. The member for they know will communities the communities that they represent and they know how to serve them best. And that is why we've brought local government back to the table of National Cabinet. And Order. Alga President Linda Scott attended National Order. Cabinet in February of this year. I've also reinstated Mali. local government ministers' meetings. We've held two in the last year, with the third one scheduled for August. The National General Assembly started on Tuesday with the Regional and Rural Forum and continues until this afternoon. The largest ever turnout with 1,100 rep representatives from across the country. With the theme, Our Communities, Our Future, the Assembly will see local government representatives come together to build policies that will help them build stronger communities across the country. With the reinstatement of the ACLG, it will be our opportunity to hear from them, hear what they need from our policies, policies that support local councils to build the communities into the strong and resilient places they need to live and work. And we are committed to providing funding to all councils in need, because on this side of the House we value fair and equal treatment of our councils, not those based on colour-coded spreadsheets. In the May budget this year, our government committed $3.1 billion through the financial assistance assistance grant program, $500 million to roads to recovery and $85 million to the bridges renewal program. Our budget also delivers $22.3 million to councils to undertake engineering assessments of local roads because we know the pressures councils are under. The financial assistance grants, which is, was enshrined in legislation thanks to the Whitlam government, provides local governments with long-term certainty and transparency and the flexibility to focus on their priority areas. Shamefully, those opposite froze indexation on the important funding stream. This Act has had an adverse impact Order. on every town and village across the country, an impact that is still being felt today. On this side of the House, we take the role that local government provide to our communities across the country seriously. We will continue to ensure that they have a voice at the table, and we will not forget them as a trusted Order. delivery partner for the federal government. Yeah. 
give the call to the member for McKellar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister for Defence. In recent weeks, there has been increased scrutiny about alleged war crimes perpetrated by the Australian Defence Force in Afghanistan. In November, David McBride will face trial for blowing the whistle about those war crimes. He is a courageous Australian who spoke up about wrongdoing that has horrified our country. Do you agree it is just not right that the first person to face trial for Australia's war crimes in Afghanistan is a whistleblower and not an alleged war criminal? Give the call to the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Defence. Uh, I thank the member for her question and um, appreciate the sincerity with which this has been asked and the seriousness, obviously, of the matters which she has referred to in her question, about which I have spoken uh, in this place on a number of occasions. Um, the matter that you've referred to, as, you, as, as is apparent in your question, is listed in the courts right now. I'm advised that it is set down for trial, as you've described in your question, later in the year. And so I think in those circumstances, um, it really would be inappropriate for me to make any further comment in this place. The call to the member for McEwen. McEwen. <laughs> Thank you, Speaker. My question is to our Attorney General. What action has the Attorney General Order. taken Order. to improve integrity? Order. The member for McEwen will begin his question again. Thank you. My question is to the Attorney General. What action has the Attorney General taken to improve integrity in government after a decade of denial and delay? Yeah. Call to the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I do thank the member for McEwen for his question, and I have to say there is a long list. Since coming to office just over a year ago, I've been astounded at the amount of work Order. that was ignored by the former government, ignored or deliberately not progressed. And I'll start with the National Anti Corruption Commission. On the first of july twenty twenty three, Australians will finally have a powerful, transparent an independent National Anti-Corruption Commission, as they were promised over four years ago by the former government. It will be one with power to prevent, detect and investigate corruption across the entire federal public sector. We are going to abolish the Administrative Appeals Tribunal and replace it with a review body which serves the interests of the Australian community, not the interests of the Liberal Party. We have restored integrity to the process for appointments to the Australian Human Rights Commissioner and we are restoring the transparent and accountable appointments process for judicial appointments, again something that is lost on those opposite. We have passed the Respect at Work legislation, another job left half done by the former government, which now requires businesses across the country to take proactive steps to create workplaces that are safe from the risk of sexual harassment. It is a major step forward for our nation. We are reinstating the Standing Council of Attorneys General, which has, under this government, agreed on collective action to address family, domestic and sexual violence. We are investing $14.7 million towards reforming Australia's sexual assault and consent laws, as well as developing better prevention services. We are investing $8.2 million in trials aimed at early intervention and the prevention of sexual harm and violence. On this side of the House, we believe in treating alleged victims of sexual assault with <coughs> respect. Yeah. When someone is brave enough to come forward with a claim of sexual assault and other workplace mistreatment, their life and private details must not be open for public examination. As the Minister for the Environment has told the House this week, rates of reporting of sexual assault crimes are low and conviction <coughs> rates are even lower. That's right. When a woman when, who is considering reporting a sexual assault sees a confidential document from another alleged victim published on the front page of a national newspaper, right. they must ponder whether the report is worth it, whether those in power are going to come after them too. Exactly. This is unacceptable. Three people had access to the confidential document which is directly, who are directly named in today's report, the member for Cook, the Shadow Attorney-General, Senator Cash and Senator Reynolds. The confidential document that is on the front page of a national newspaper was published without regard for the interests of an alleged victim of sexual assault. 
her rights have not Order. been respected. Attorney General's time. Yeah. 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 Give the call to the Prime Minister. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper.